Okay, thanks, every, thanks, uh, Jennifer, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is just a, a brief talk on the diagnosis and treatment of knee pain. I'm going to go over some basic things, and then, as uh, Jen mentioned, there's some uh, questions uh, at the end. Answer I, I can answer at the end. Uh, this is a list of my uh, training as a medical student in residence. I will just go ahead and advance it for you, Dr. Nolan. If you could just let me know when to do that, that would be great. Uh, go ahead, advance it. Okay. So the first thing is um, when you're talking about any area, um, sometimes the pain comes from that area and sometimes it is referred from other areas. Now that's probably more common in the shoulder and the hip orthopedically, but even in the knee, there are, there are occasions when someone comes into our office complaining of knee pain and really the problem isn't from the knee. An example would be a lot of times hip arthritis actually presents with pain in the medial aspect of the knee. And it's really not until you do a physical examination that you realize it's not a knee problem. Likewise, sciatica, which classically is pain down the back of the buttocks into the leg, uh, sometimes the pain is limited to the back of the knee and a person might perceive that as being a knee problem. So uh, the first thing we do is have to decide, is this actually a knee problem? Uh, you could advance it again, Jennifer, if you would. So of the causes of primary knee pain, there are a number. Um, bursitis, inflammation of the bursa, tendonitis, instability, torn meniscus, uh, infection, uh, arthritis and uh, chondromalacia. Uh, they're the most common causes of knee pain. Again, if you could uh, advance it, Jennifer. So bursitis is very common. Uh, this is a picture on the right of uh, what was called water in the knee. It's actually water on the knee. There are several bursas around the knee uh, that are essentially potential spaces that can fill up with fluid when they're inflamed. Um, that can be caused by uh, excessive kneeling. Uh, people who uh, lay carpet for a living almost always have this as a chronic condition. It can be caused by overuse or can be caused by trauma. Uh, next slide. So the treatment, as is the case with a lot of these, generally fairly simple, straightforward. Um, a lot of times it's activity modification, uh, meaning we tell people not to do what is aggravating the situation. Sometimes it's just reassurance. They have a bump on their knee and they're worried that it's something bad and we tell them it's, it's not anything to worry about. Uh, or in the case of a large bursa that's inflamed and bothersome, sometimes aspirating or injecting the knee uh, can take care of the problem. And rarely if it's a bursa that's recurrent, comes back again and again, we will remove it surgically. Uh, next slide, please. Tendonitis is an inflammation of the tendon. There are two main tendons in the knee. One is the quadriceps, which inserts into the top of the kneecap. The other is the patellar tendon, which is below the kneecap. Again, this generally presents as pain in that area. It's almost always caused by overuse. The treatment is almost never surgical. It's usually a combination of medication. Again, a big one is always activity modification. Uh, somebody's uh, playing basketball uh, six hours a day, their knee starts to bother them a lot of time, activity modification. And there are sometimes, the picture on the right is a picture of a, a Chopad strap, which is good for uh, patellar tendonitis. Uh, these are things that are never amenable to injections because the injection in those areas can actually cause the tendon to rupture. Uh, next slide. So a very specific tendonitis is iliotibial band syndrome. There's a tendon along the lateral aspect of the knee. And as you flex and extend your knee, uh, the tendon tends to go back and forth across the bony prominence on the outside part of the knee and cause pain laterally. Lateral is on the outside part of your knee. It's very common in runners. Uh, again, the treatment, uh, generally stretching. Uh, if you're running on a circular track, like an indoor track, a lot of times the treatment involves alternating which way you go every other time. A period of rest and anti-inflammatory medication sometimes inserts orthotics into the shoes. And again, very rarely surgical intervention is, uh, is indicated. Uh, next slide, please. So technically strains represent a stretching of the tendons and muscles and a sprain is a stretching of the ligament. Uh, this is a diagram of the inside of the knee. You can see the anterior cruciate ligament and behind that the posterior cruciate ligament. 
And then there are the two ligaments on the inside and the outside part of the knee, the medial and collateral ligaments. Uh, the ligaments on the outside part of the knee get stretched frequently. These are usually contact injuries. Uh, unless it's very severe, the treatment is usually immobilization and some type of a brace followed by some physical therapy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. In the case of the anterior cruciate ligament, if it's torn, that is usually a non-contact injury. The ligament connects the front part of the tibia to the back part of the femur. Uh, it's very common in sports, football, uh, soccer, basketball, any kind of non-contact twisting injury. They will not heal. The question really is whether they need to be fixed. And a lot of that depends on what your expectations are, the age of the person, the activity level, uh, what your expectations are. Um, next slide, please. If somebody is relatively young and relatively young today probably constitutes somebody up into their 50s, uh, again, depending on what your expectations are, depending on what your activity levels are, the, the treatment is to do a reconstruction. You cannot fix the ligament. You basically have to replace it with something else. This is a picture of what is probably the gold standard for an athletic individual who has an ACL, uh, an ACL injury. You basically take the middle third of the patellar tendon and drill some holes. This can be done arthroscopically and put the graft inside the knee and you basically reconstruct the ligament. It's not as good as what mother nature did, but it's, it's as close as we've come to and generally they do very well. Next slide, please. There are different ways of doing this. There are different ligaments that you can use. Uh, this is another picture here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, the third. So there's a couple different ways of doing this. And the big uh, differential is, do you wanna use the person's own soft tissue, like an autograft, or do you wanna use an allograft, which is a cadaver graft. Now the cadaver grafts are easier on the patient because you don't have to take part of their tissue. It's a much quicker operation, much less discomfort. Uh, there is some evidence in uh, high performance athletes that there's a higher re-rupture rate. So generally speaking, most people uh, don't uh, do this as the first option in somebody under the age of 25, or if someone is, let's say a division one or professional athlete. But for a weekend warrior in their mid thirties that has an ACL tear, that doesn't have uh, six weeks to stay out of work. Uh, these are almost as good, the allografts, uh, and uh, they allow uh, return to essentially full function. Uh, next slide, please. Anytime you have these injuries, you need to brace them afterwards for a period of time. And in some patients, if they decide they're not interested in surgical intervention. This is a picture on the right of what's called a derotational brace. So that was what they did in the old days before the surgery was perfected. And that is still a treatment option either with or without surgery. And any way you slice this, um, a part of the treatment involves rehabilitating the knees. Uh, in the case of the ACL, you want to strengthen the hamstring uh, muscles that also act as secondary stabilizers uh, for the ACL. Uh, next slide, please. So a very common injury is a meniscus tear or a cartilage tear. Um, that is generally a contact injury. In younger patients, that's the injury that people get when they're twisting their knee, when they're running down the field or going up for a layup. Uh, this is a picture of the knee, inside the knee. You can see a piece of cartilage here, meniscus. It's on the wrong side of this bone. Uh, this is a picture of what you do. You basically take it out. Uh, in a young person, this is the operation where we scope them and they go back to playing sports in three or four weeks. Um, in an older person, this can happen as a result of a less trauma, maybe getting out of a chair the wrong way, and the recovery may be a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, different. Um, next slide, please. Okay. And again, these are, uh, this is a picture, a diagram of the knee. Uh, these are the two ligaments. These two C-shaped cartilages are like cushions uh, and that's what uh, is torn. Usually it's a twisting or torquing type injury uh, that causes a tearing. Uh, you can see, it, again, this is a diagram here of a little tear. Something like this is very simple to fix. You go in and smooth this out and there's almost no recovery involved. Uh, next, uh, di next picture, please. Okay, again, this is another picture of the same thing. We do these arthroscopically under, depending on the individual, either local with sedation or sometimes general 
it's a 15 minute procedure through uh, two band-aid sized incisions. Um, in somebody who's younger, we generally recommend doing this if there's a tear. If somebody's older, you can decide whether or not the symptoms warrant doing it. Uh, again, if somebody's 60 year, years old and they have a MRI which shows a tear and they're not having any symptoms, you don't necessarily need to fix every tear. So that depends on the, uh, the symptoms of the patient. Next slide, please. Again, these are things you cannot diagnose in an MRI based on an X-ray. Our ability to diagnose on the basis of history and physical examination is probably in the neighborhood of 60%. So we almost always get an MRI of the knee. Uh, this is a picture of an MRI slide showing uh, this should be a normal black triangle here. This is a clean tear right through the middle. Again, there are minor tears and major tears. This is a minor tear, a ma major tear rather. So this is somebody who in the presence of any symptoms would recommend having an arthroscopic procedure. Back in the past, the past being probably in the 1970s, these were treated through open incisions and the entire meniscus was removed. What they found is that in addition to a longer recovery that led to the development of arthritis in the knee. So now we generally remove only that part of the meniscus that's torn, leaving as much as we can behind. The downside is if you leave some behind, it's possible that you can re-tear it, but the upside is patients do much better and have a much lower incidence of developing post-traumatic arthritis. If you leave a tear in there, there's also an increased risk of developing post-traumatic arthritis. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this is how it's done arthroscopically. Uh, next slide. Okay, so chondromalacia. What that is, is basically softening of the cartilage in the undersurface of the kneecap. This is by far the most common uh, cause of knee pain for people that we see in the office, all age groups, uh, very common in young females, uh, teenage and, and slightly younger. Um, the thing you have to understand uh, that there's not necessarily a correlation between the severity of the pain and the severity of the condition. So uh, this is something that is always treated non-surgically. Um, again, the overall, even though we're, we're surgeons and we do surgery on patients' knees, most of the people that come into our office have problems that don't require significant intervention. They can be treated with an exercise program, physical therapy, activity modification, sometimes an injection, uh, perhaps some anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, arthritis, which is the main focus of the talk. So arthritis means inflammation of the joint, but as a practical matter, it means wearing away of the cartilage. It can be caused by a number of things. The most common is degenerative, that's wear and tear. It can be post-traumatic, meaning as a result of an injury, damage to the cartilage, you then subsequently develop arthritis. It can be inflammatory, which is like rheumatologic, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and it can be caused as a result of a really an infection. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a picture or a diagram of an arthritic knee. Basically what I describe this is if you think of the end of a chicken bone that's nice and shiny, it's like somebody sanded down the cartilage and you get something that looks like this. Next slide. So on x-ray, this is a normal knee x-ray. This is what you want your knee x-ray to look like. You've got nice clear spaces in between the bone. That's articular cartilage. Next slide. This is what it looks like if you have severe arthritis. This is bone on bone. The cartilage is completely gone. Over here, you've got uh, some narrowing and irregularity. On, this, on the lateral view of the kneecap, you've got bone spurs. So this is somebody who has fairly advanced arthritis in their knee. Next slide. How do you tell? Clinically, the person comes in, they complain the knee hurts. They say they have stiffness. They'll describe swelling. If it gets severe enough, you'll get deformity. The, you'll either get a bow leg or knock kneed. You get instability, <clears throat> meaning the knee can give out, causing you to fall. And gait disturbance is a fancy way to say you walk with a limp. Uh, these are the things that, that people present with, and then we examine them, and that's how we come up with the diagnosis. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of different treatments. And again, general rule of thumb, we start out with the simplest, least expensive, least invasive treatment first, and work our way up the pecking order, so to speak. Next slide. So a lot of people figure this out on their own, but 
you use a cane. Ideally, use it in the opposite side of the knee that's hurting you. People use this, maybe a lot of times the arthritis isn't that bad. They'll just use it when they go to the mall, but they don't need it when they're around the hips. So that's one of the things that you can do if your knee's bothering you. Next slide. As it progresses, depending on your condition, depending on your strength, uh, you may need to use a walker. Again, most people today don't like to have to rely on that if they don't have to, but as a short-term uh, treatment or in the case of somebody who, who doesn't have the ability to be treated in any other fashion, uh, this is a, a way of treating this to uh, facilitate mobilization. Next treatment, next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, there are a number of vitamins out there, over-the-counter vitamins. Uh, they're marketed by a lot of different names. They generally have these glucosamine and chondroitin uh, as their main products. Uh, they don't do any harm. There's no evidence that they actually do any good. Um, there, are there is evidence that they're effective in the treatment of arthritis in dog hips. But in people, uh, studies are not really conclusive. So uh, if you're thinking of taking something like this, fine, no, no problem doing it. Uh, as far as we can tell, there's no evidence that they actually help. And there's certainly no evidence that they actually affect the disease itself. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So bracing, again, this is a fairly substantial brace. There's two types of braces for knee arthritis. This is actually an unloader brace that will try to take pressure off the inside part of the knee where the, uh, the knee is most arthritic. Or you may find you just get some benefit from a simple, uh, less lightweight uh, knee brace or even an over-the-counter neoprene sleeve. Uh, a lot of people, if they have a little bit of arthritis, they might put something like that on when they're gonna play a little tennis or golf. Uh, and that's fine. It doesn't, it doesn't control the disease process, but it takes care of the symptoms, which is ultimately what you're looking to do. Uh, next slide, please. So what I didn't include, it somehow got taken out by mistake, but there's a slide I have on weight loss. Um, it's pretty much good for everything that ails you. Uh, it's certainly good for arthritis. And if you are uh, substantially overweight, getting yourself closer to your ideal body weight is a very important part of the treatment for symptomatic knee arthritis. Uh, medication, uh, uh, Aleve or Advil, over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medication uh, can be effective. Next slide. Likewise, there are a number of prescription anti-inflammatories. They all work the same way. We used to hand this out like it was candy. I think we're a little bit less prone to do so now because there's some evidence that long-term these can cause problems with uh, people if they have kidney disease. So generally, if you have hypertension, you need to be careful taking these. Um, there are certainly potential to cause problems with the gastrointestinal system causing GI bleeding. And uh, people that are on blood thinners have to be careful because they can cause bleeding. Having said that, there's, they can be very effective, certainly short term. If you have arthritis and you're going to play around a golf or you're going to go on a, a trip where you're going to be doing a lot of talking and you don't have a medical reason not to do it, uh, then uh, taking anti-inflammatories for a brief period of time can be very effective. Uh, next, <clears throat> and I didn't mention Tylenol, but Tylenol, again, it's just a painkiller, but it can be effective. So injections, there are a couple different type of injections into the knee. And again, you're treating the condition locally rather than systemically. Uh, next slide. So viscoelastic supplements. Uh, they're called gels. Some people call them lubricants. Um, they're basically initially derived from rooster combs. Now they're synthetic, most of them. There are about seven or eight, probably 10 different ones on the market. They're all equivalent in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, usually what, when you get, uh, it's determined by your doctor's preference and whatever insurance uh, company you have approves. Uh, but these can be very effective. Uh, they initially felt that they were causing lubrication. Basically, I think most people feel now they're just a long-acting anti-inflammatory. As opposed to cortisone, which can work very effectively but can cause damage to the articular cartilage, these don't have that uh, side effect. They're more expensive. They last a longer period of time, generally six months up to a year. Uh, probably effective maybe 60, 70% of the time. I've got patients that have been having them done every every other year for every every six months for, for five or 10 years. Other people, they work for a couple of times and then they stop working. Some people get no relief at all. So it's, it's, it's kind of potluck, but it's something that we do for people who 
either don't have enough arthritis to warrant something further or don't want to or can't have something further done. Uh, next slide, please. So then there's surgical intervention. And there are a number of surgical procedures that we do. Uh, and I'm gonna go over them one by one. Um, and they all have a role in the treatment of uh, knee arthritis. Next slide. So what we used to do a fair amount of arthroscopic chondroplasty, where you go and you smooth out the cartilage, it looks very irregular, you kind of smooth it down. Uh, we used to do it a lot more than we do now because it turns out it doesn't really work that well, at least according to the, the large studies that are done. There's probably some indication for it, but um, just smoothing out the cartilage really doesn't provide much long-term relief, maybe six to 12 months, and you can decide whether that's worth it, but. Uh, in the long run, it's not a very effective long-term treatment. Uh, next slide, please. So if somebody has a meniscus tear and they have arthritis, um, generally an arthroscopic removal of meniscus won't help, it may actually hurt. However, if somebody has some arthritis, but they have an acute meniscal tear superimposed on that, and their symptoms are localized right to that area, or if they're having what we call mechanical symptoms where their knee is blocked, locking or giving way, there's still times when going in and smoothing out the meniscus in that area will relieve the symptoms and preclude you from having to do a bigger operation. Uh, next slide. Um, if you have a very localized area where the cartilage is worn down the bone and the rest of the knee is okay, you can do what's called a microfracture where you basically drill holes in the bone and try to get them to the cartilage to grow or there are actually procedures where you can get cartilage and graft it in there. Um, that's generally only good if you have a small area that's involved, generally only effective in younger individuals. Um, this requires you then to be non-weight bearing for six weeks. Um, and it's one of the options that we have available to us. Next slide. Okay, but all what, what I just talked about, they're generally limited treatments for localized arthritis if you have fairly advanced arthritis, these generally aren't going to be of any benefit. Uh, next slide. So there's two things I'm going to talk about briefly. Um, PRP, plasma, plasma rich protein, and stem cell therapy. Uh, they are heavily marketed. They're fairly new technologies. Um, I generally say they're not uh, technically according to the, well, they're not FDA approved. And according to the Academy, they're not considered to be necessarily safe or effective. At the end of the day, we really haven't figured out what their role is. There probably is some promise in these uh, treatments. We just don't know exactly what patients are good candidates for them and, and who's not. Um, it's likely that younger patients with smaller, more localized defects are probably more likely to benefit from these types of things. Um, in general, um, the PRP is a lot less expensive than the stem cell. None of this is covered by insurance. And while, uh, and we do it in our group, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that the fee schedule is somewhere in the $1,500 range of people that will market this and charge $5,000. This is one of the areas where the marketing is way ahead of the medicine. Um, the holy grail of orthopedics is to get cartilage to grow back so we don't have to put something um, mechanical in there, like a knee replacement. And uh, sadly, we're not there yet, is what it comes down to. So at some point in the time, this may be the standard of treatment. Uh, so if you see this as an option, uh, just have a serious conversation with somebody and get the, the honest you know, pros and cons. So right now, the, the jury is clearly not in on this. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the definitive treatment for somebody who has significant symptomatic arthritis in the knee that has not responded to conservative treatment is a total knee replacement. Uh, next slide. We call it a total knee replacement because when the hips came out, we replaced the whole joint. It's really a resurfacing operation, but it's called a knee arthroplasty or knee replacement. What you're doing is you're resurfacing, you're taking some bone and cartilage away from the bottom of the femur and putting a metal liner. Same thing with the tibia, piece of plastic in between, and you may be resurfacing the kneecap as well. Next slide, please. Again, this is the diagram of the same thing from the front and the side. This is not air. This is in real life, this would be bearing on that. Uh, these these, these are, are modular. So when you do the operation, you basically have one that fits the individual question. Uh, next slide. 
And again, this is a picture of a real total knee replacement in, in a person. Next slide. So all knee replacements are basically the same in the sense that you have to make an incision in the front of the knee. You use some method to remove the bone and cartilage a little bit, take some measurements, and then put an implant in, either cement it or press fit it. You put a little spacer, a plastic spacer, and then you close the wound. So all marketing aside, that's what every knee replacement that's ever been done anywhere involves. Uh, next slide, please. There are some variations, okay. Do you replace the entire knee joint or do you just do one side? Uh, there are pros and cons of that. <clears throat> do you remove and replace or do you leave the posterior cruciate ligament intact? What type of guides do you use? How long is the incision? And which company's implants do you use? Next slide. Uh, again, unicompartmental, you just replace the one side. Uh, I'm going to give you my uh, okay, market warning. I, this is not something I'm a huge fan of. It's, it's something that uh, some people do, in, and it's indicated in some patients. Uh, it became very popular in the 70s and then fell out of favor because it didn't work very well. It became very popular in the early 2000s and then fell out of favor because they didn't work very well. It's gained some popularity mm, four or five years ago with the use of uh, computer technology. Uh, there are certain patients that are candidates, but uh, in general, um, my personal opinion, this is not everyone's opinion that does a knee replacement surgery. Generally, if you have enough arthritis to warrant doing this type of operation, you have enough arthritis to do a knee replacement. Uh, the downside of this is that if you do one of these and it fails over time, and they generally do fail over anywhere from five to 15 years, uh, when you convert this to a total knee, the results aren't as good. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this is a picture of when, when just the medial side of the knee is replaced here. And here you can see the lateral side is pretty good. So this is somebody who may have been a reasonable candidate for that. This is a patel femoral resurfacing procedure. This person only had arthritis in the patel femoral joint. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another question is, do you take the posterior cruciate out? The posterior cruciate ligament is the ligament behind the anterior cruciate. Almost all knee replacements re involve taking the AC out. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. The fact that in this country, about half the people take the posterior cruciate ligament out and half don't tells you there's no right answer to the question. In my career, I've actually switched back and forth. I generally take the cruciate out now. The advantage to leaving the cruciate in is that some people think it leaves a slightly more normal feeling knee. The disadvantage is that as the cruciate then tightens up, it, it doesn't work as well. The advantage of taking the cruciate out and replacing it, you get a little better range of motion. Um, disadvantage is it takes a few more minutes to do the surgery. Uh, so if that's a surgeon's choice type of thing. You're probably not even gonna be aware of that if you don't know to answer the question. Um, next slide, please. And again, these are just a picture of some implants you can see here. There's nothing in that space because that's a cruciate uh, retaining knee in the, in, the, in the knee, there would be a cruciate there. And here is a, a, a where the cruciate is taken out and you use this little piece of plastic to basically provide the support that the cruciate would, uh, would normally support. Uh, next slide. So over the course of time, improved use of regional anesthesia, that's spinal anesthesia, epidurals, nerve blocks, and long acting local injections have dramatically reduced the need for narcotics. If you had a knee replacement in 2008, you probably spent four days in the hospital, some of it hooked up to a morphine pump, and then were prescribed you know, 50 Percocet when you went home with another 50 to go after that. The amount of pain that people have now, and obviously everyone's an individual and some people still have more pain than others, is dramatically decreased, largely due to these non-surgical changes, different medications we use, and, and, the, and the improvements in anesthesia that have occurred, have occurred, I would say, since 2010 or 2012. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is a diagram of a, of a total knee on an x-ray. Uh, this is the uh, metal. This is a polyethylene, which is a fancy plastic. Um, and this doesn't look like they resurface the kneecap, but uh, so you're not actually replacing the knee, you're resurfacing it. 
And uh, the weight is borne on this uh, polyethylene, which with the newer polyethylene can last 25, 30 years. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, the combination of newer drugs, anti-inflammatory medication, uh, Neurontin, gabapentin, and these long-acting narcotics, which you are again losing, using less uh, frequently, have, have made this a far less painful procedure than if you talk to somebody or if you had something like this done in 2008, 2010, 2012. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the other things that has changed over the last, I'm gonna say eight to 10 years, is the amount of bleeding. If you had an operation like this in 2010, you probably had a drain put in your knee that somebody pulled out a day or two later. Um, there's a drug called transamic acid or TXA, which basically helps blood clots that are formed not break up. Um, so the use of transfusions, which might've been 10, 12%, maybe even higher 10 years ago, down to almost zero. I, I can't remember the last time I transfused somebody with a uh, knee or hip replacement. I haven't probably in the last five years. Um, we don't use drains anymore with rare exceptions. So this has been a tremendous advantage. There are a few people that can't get it. If you have a history of a recent blood clot, or if you um, have kidney disease, or for some random reason, if you're colorblind, uh, you can't use this drug. Again, this is something your surgeon would know, uh, but, but otherwise we use this and it's really made the uh, procedure a lot safer, uh, a lot less uh, invasive. Uh, next slide, please. So the surgery has gotten a lot better in terms of smaller incisions. The, the implant technology has improved. Um, so the function's better. That changes how long people are in the hospital. That changes uh, who's a good candidate for this surgery. Uh, it used to be that you had to be 65 or 70 to do this. Um, it used to be you could count on being out of work for you know, three months, four months. That has been considerably improved. So the, the number of patients that we can do, how long it takes to do them, and who's a candidate for this has changed a lot over the last 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. So while the operation hasn't changed that much from the surgical standpoint, from our standpoint, from the standpoint of the, on the receiving end, the patient, it's a much different experience than it was uh, several years ago. Uh, next slide. And I just said that part. So next slide, please. Um, length of stay has changed dramatically. Uh, the age has changed considerably. Again, uh, we, we like people to be older rather than younger, uh, but uh, people in their 60s certainly is not an issue. People in their 50s, ideally, you know, you want to make sure you absolutely need the operation, but it's something that if we know that the thing's got a good chance of lasting 25 to 30 years, it's an option now, whereas it wasn't when we were talking about five to 10 years survival rates. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this was always done in the hospital before, and we still do a lot of our joints in the hospital. Uh, our, we go to Robert Wood and Princeton and Hopewell and St. Mary's. Um, and we do that primarily now, not so much for the surgery, but if patients have medical conditions that require a hospitalization. Uh, if you have an irregular heart rate that needs monitoring, that's an indication to be in a hospital. If you're, if you're, if you're heavy, if you have some uh, medical conditions, uh, we do them in the hospital. Uh, obviously you have the ability to stay overnight. And although even in the hospitals now, Medicare and most of the insurance companies consider this a same day procedure. It's a case where we went from being in the hospital when I was a resident, people were staying in the hospital for two and a half weeks to you know, seven or eight years ago, two or three days. And then a lot of people went to rehab we learned how to do it. So some people can go home the same day. Now the insurance companies want everybody to go home the same day. Probably not appropriate that everybody go home the same day, but it's certainly a 23 hour stay. And then if you have some problems, you can, you can stay longer. And there's still a small group of people that need to go to rehab. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, more recently in the last five or six years, we've been doing a lot of our joints in our surgical center. It's kind of a concierge type experience. Uh, we only do uh, patients who are, let's say, cherry picked. Uh, it's more efficient because the staff there only does that type of procedure. It's not so much for the patient, but it's far less expensive for the people that are paying the bills and that's why they like it. Um, fewer complications for a lot of reasons. 
since nobody's ever allowed in there that's had an infection, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have a lot of sick people around you. Um, we tend to select out patients who are less likely to have complications. And again, we have a, you know, we have a physical therapist sitting around waiting for you to get better, uh, recover from the anesthesia and start your therapy right away, as opposed to in a larger institution, you got to, things just take longer. So the throughput is a lot quicker. Uh, it's a lot more efficient, probably a lot more pleasant experience if you're a candidate for that. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the, I want to say controversies or variations that you might hear from people uh, that are talking about knee replacements. The standard way of doing an operation, you, it's, a, it's a carpentry procedure. You need to make cuts. They have to be pretty exact. These are some of the jigs that we used to use that have been used since the operation was designed. There are, there is no evidence that the newer things that we sometimes use are any better than that. That's what the Academy of Orthopedic Surgery tells you. That is what the studies say. I'm not 100% sure I believe that, but uh, there's certainly, this is the standard of care and it's a very reasonable thing to do. And when, you're, when you have a question when you're doing these operations, this is your fallback. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the things that came out 15 years ago was, why don't we have somebody take a CAT scan or an MRI of the knee let the engineers look at it and come up with a little block so we can just slap this on there and make the cuts, save some time. I did this for a few years. I don't think it saved any time, maybe a little bit. I'm pretty sure it's not as accurate as the standard cuts, uh, but there are still some people that use this um, and it's, it's, there's also an added expense. Uh, next slide. This is what I think is uh, the, the best advancement. So you're talking about computer, guided technology, computer, computer navigation. Uh, this is a, basically a little device that's uh, hooked up to a, a computer that it looks like it's the size of an iPhone, basically. We put it, we snap it on a little guide, we do the surgery, move the leg around.